Since 2017, AOC has been working closely with Historic Ascent, a community heritage group based in the Highlands of Scotland, to excavate, conserve and present one of the most spectacular Iron Age settlements in the UK, Clactoe Brock. Over the last few years, my colleagues at AOC have presented scores of lectures about this project. This lecture is specific to our analysis of the artefacts uncovered during our work. After months of carefully removing stone, we uncovered a remarkably well-preserved sequence of floors and hearths. Critically, the end of occupation at Clack Toe seems to have been marked by a major fire and the building was abandoned in a hurry, meaning that we have a unique insight into people's lives 2,000 years ago. Left behind under the collapsed and burnt rubble were a wealth of artefacts, presumably abandoned on the many floors of the collapsing roundhouse. This catastrophic event provides a wonderful snapshot into an extended Iron Age family's activity sometime between 100 BC and AD 100. Further, the preservation allows a rare glimpse into object types that do not usually survive on many other Atlantic Iron Age sites. Finally, some of the finds give us a very good opportunity to delve deeper into wider questions concerning Iron Age artefact studies such as chronology, agriculture, crafts, decoration and wider contacts. This lecture is concerned with teasing out wider narratives from the Clack Toll artefacts. The next 20 minutes will not be a run through of all the different types of materials and objects recovered. Instead, I want to focus on the main points of interest that can be drawn from the collective material. I should also stress that although I have the privilege of presenting the lecture for this year's Archaeological Research and Progress, what I'm about to present is the result of a collective effort of many individuals, including the two Clacktoe directors, Graham Cavers and John Barber, and a suite of fine specialists, including Don McLaren, Helen Chittick and Anne Crone. It goes without saying, of course, that none of what I'm about to present would have been possible without the amazing community at Clack Toll, the numerous volunteers and the sponsors. Our AOC video that accompanies this conference highlights far more about the archaeology, outreach and conservation at Clack Toll. For now, this lecture is concerned with the artefacts and what they tell us. Let us first turn to issues of chronology. The excavations at Clack Toll are incredibly important for a number of reasons, none more important than the chronology. The dates from the interior deposits form a very tight grip between 100 BC and AD 100. This is important as this means that all of the artefacts discussed today were in use and deposited during this short window of time. If this was not important enough, we would also argue that the finds may allow us, at least in theory, but not in science, to narrow these 200 years even more. We would argue that what we have left at Clack Toll is actually the remnants of family activities that probably cover no more than 10 to 20 years. This, we would argue, is suggested by the pottery and some stone objects. For example, the total number of pottery vessels from Clack Toll is incredibly small. There can be no more than 20 to 30 vessels this is a remarkably small number when you consider that contemporary sites like Solace, Dunvillain and Neep had between 200 and 3,000 vessels. Sites like Neep and Solace were not multi-period tell sites, like for example Gurness and the Howe, where the large number of vessels is a conflation of hundreds, if not thousands of years of activities. This cannot alone explain why wheelhouse sites like Neep and Solace have between 10 and 100 times more vessels than at Clack Toll. Given we think Clack Toll literally went up in smoke, is it realistic to believe that the inhabitants had the time to remove hundreds of vessels whilst their home was ablaze? And would you really risk your life to save the family meal? Despite the very tight radiocarbon dates from Clack Toll, we believe that the limited number of vessels suggests that the debris represent activities of an extended family of no more than 10 to 20 years. This snapshot theory appears to be supported by one of the most iconic finds from Clack Toll, this knocking stone found in the Brock interior. It was used to dehusk barley and was filled with partially processed barley grains. 
When we discovered the knocking stone, it was packed full of burnt grain, suggesting again that the site was abandoned in a hurry. Thus, although the resolution of the radiocarbon dates does not allow definitive proof, we would argue that the limited pottery numbers and knocking stone grain suggest that we are witnessing an almost Pompeii effect, a snapshot of an Iron Age family's life. If this is true of the pottery and knocking stone, it is probably the same for all the other evidence found inside Clactol Broch. If true, what I'm away to describe are the artefacts and activities of one family generation living and working together in northern mainland Scotland around 2000 years ago. Let us begin then, quite literally, by turning the lights on. A large number of steatite bowl-shaped vessels were found. These vessels are often found at Iron Age sites across Scotland, but the number found at Clack Toll is unusually large. No two examples are the same, and this may reflect the individual styles of those who made them. The distribution of the vessels within the brock and the damage some of them sustained suggest they were being used or stored on the upper levels of the brock when the structure collapsed. These objects have traditionally been interpreted as lamps for giving light, and samples collected from some of the vessels produced evidence of beeswax. Interestingly, lots of wooden splinters were discovered during our work, mostly of Scots pine. They may have been the result of chopping wood for kindling. However, the tips of some are burnt, suggesting that they may have been used as tapers for lighting, a bit like candles. In the early modern period, splinters of resin-rich pine were used as fir candles. About 50 pine splinters, all burnt at one end, were found at Oakbank Cranog in Loch Tay, testifying to the use of this practice in the Iron Age. The fir candles may have been lit with the aid of striker lights, which we also found, the stone objects used for creating sparks to ignite fires. Now we have illuminated the brock, what were they doing inside the circular walls? Many of the finds were, unsurprisingly, related to agriculture, food and drink. Eight rotary querns, used in the processing of grain to create flour, were found and many showed signs of having been very well used. Worn and broken examples were later used as paving stones. It is likely that the wide range of cobble tools were used in a range of different food processing activities. Bone and antler are versatile materials that were used to make a wide range of different objects during the Iron Age. The community at Clack Toll took advantage of locally available materials, creating objects from the bones of the sheep, goats and pigs they reared, as well as the antlers of wild red deer. Whalebone, likely scavenged from the local beach, were also used. 30 recognisable iron objects were recovered from Clack Toll. The assemblage is unusual in many respects, not least due to the quantity of very robust iron objects that survive, a rare occurrence on Atlantic Iron Age sites. Again, the assemblage is dominated by tools, particularly those associated with agriculture, such as sickles, ards, spades and reaping hooks, and food and drink, such as knives and vessels. Stone tools, such as whetstones, were undoubtedly used for sharpening the metal blades. As we've seen, waterlogged deposits at Clack Toll allowed for the preservation of a small assemblage of wooden artefacts. Among the wooden artefacts was a fragment of a vessel rough out, a piece of an unfinished bowl shaped with an axe on the outside and roughly carved out on the inside. It was made from a half log of an alder. Alder has always been favoured for vessel manufacture because of its resistance to splitting and its durability under wet conditions, which make it suitable for holding liquids and food. Possible evidence of another alder vessel at the Brock is found in a concentration of alder charcoal around a deposit of grain. And of course we found various forms of pottery. Where size could be reconstructed, the vessels fall broadly into two types. Smaller vessels, best viewed as vases or drinking cups, and larger vessels, probably jars and urns for storage and food preparation. Residue analysis demonstrated that six of the pots were used solely to process dairy products such as milk, butter or cheese. 
Three further vessels were used to process dairy products and marine products such as fish, seal or whale. Analysis also shows that a number of vessels were used to process leafy plants. Thus, although all vessels were predominantly used to process dairy products, the majority were multi-use, also being used to process marine and plant resources, whether at the same time or on separate occasions. Although the organic interior decorations do not survive on Brock sites, at Clactall we perhaps have rare evidence of fixtures and fittings. These two small wooden pins, squared off at one end and shaped to a point to the other, were most likely used in joinery, perhaps for small personal items such as storage boxes rather than structural joinery. The artefacts from Clactoll also show that the inhabitants carried out a range of crafts. Spindle whorls tell us that individuals spun fibres into yarn and the discovery of a number of unfinished roughouts suggests that the whorls themselves were produced at the site. Many of the iron objects are associated with crafts, for example, shears for the processing of hides and fleeces and axes, adds and a possible chisel for woodworking. A variety of crafts and activities are also indicated by various bone and anther objects. Many are related to textile production, such as needles and these long handled combs. Others were tools for preparing hides to make leather. Again, a number of unfinished objects were found, like this toggle, telling us that bone and antler objects were being made on site. We've also analysed traces on the surface of the bone and antler objects to understand how they were made. Tool marks show the use of iron tools such as axes or cleavers, saws and fine blades. The objects were then shaped using pumice or sandstone. The perforated needle shown here, for example, is covered with irregular scratches made during the manufacturing process. Though perhaps not the most aesthetically pleasing, this bone object tells us a great deal about on-site activities. Made from a whale vertebra, it was used as a chopping block in working surface. One side is covered with tool marks made during craft activities. The marks were formed by at least four different tools ranging from punches to cleavers. No evidence of non-ferrous metalworking was recovered, although there was evidence for ironworking. Over three and a half kilograms of vitrified material or slag was found. The association of ironworking with Brox is well attested elsewhere, but the clactol assemblage is completely atypical in composition, representing only parts of what appears to have been a very inefficient smelting process. Most iron age sites have evidence of smithing, that is, the secondary working to create actual tools and objects. The clactol assemblage is related to the primary extraction of the actual metal from the earth. No evidence of in situ metalworking within the Brock itself was indicated, suggesting that although ironworking was taking place in the vicinity prior to or during the occupation of the tower, the slag must have been, for whatever reason, brought into the Brock. Whilst many may view this as some form of ritual deposition, the material may simply have been brought in with other material and spread across the interior space as flooring or levelling material. Dress accessories are among the most intimate of objects discovered on archaeological sites. They conjure up images of the people who wore them. Five pins were found on the site, three of bone and one each of copper and iron. These pins would have been worn as ornaments, fastening together cloaks or other garments. Decoration was clearly important to the inhabitants. All of the pottery vessels had decoration of some kind, including applied, such as various cordons with roundels and bosses, incised or impressed with pointed tools, or as in here on the left, a ring-headed pin. The vessel on the right is particularly elaborate, decorated with a variety of techniques, including an applied cordon that mimics wheat Many of the whorls from Clactol were decorated with a series of incised lines. Similarly, the steatite vessel was adorned with linear decoration, another glimpse of Iron Age aesthetics. A standout object was this whalebone pommel, 
A pommel is a rounded knob fitted to the end of the handle of a sword or dagger. While no traces remain of the metal handle and blade, its small size suggests it was from a dagger. Similar pommels have been found in other brocks and in wheelhouses across the northern and western elves. The pommel from Clactol Brock, therefore, probably points to a wider network of contacts beyond the site in its immediate local area. And so too do other objects. Although most of the querns from Clactol were made from locally available stone, some examples were imported from further afield, demonstrating the networks of trade and contacts enjoyed by those living in the Broch. The pottery also gives a very good opportunity to delve deeper into probable links with other sub-regions in the Atlantic area. For example, are the types and styles more akin to the Hebridean sky tradition or to the Caithness, Orkney, Shetland sequence? As part of the wider analysis, every published pottery assemblage from 1000 BC to AD 400 from across Atlantic Scotland was assessed, and it is clear that the Clactol pottery is more akin to pottery from the Inner and Outer Hebrides, with striking parallels with pottery from Balavulin, Dunvulin, Bailon, Bailshire, Hornish Point, Kilfeder and Achir Darkmoor. The pottery is entirely different from that recovered from Caithness and the overwhelming majority of the Northern Elves, and, perhaps unsurprising given their location, indicates that the inhabitants of Clack Toll were closely associated with their Hebridean neighbours in a way that facilitated transfer of pottery ornamentation motifs. In a very real sense, the artefacts from Clack Toll are of a mundane, domestic nature. Although evidence of high status objects in Middle Iron Age Atlantic Scotland are rarer themselves, there are no examples of, for example, non-ferrous metalworking, Roman finds or amber beads that occur on other Atlantic Scottish sites, particularly in Caithness and the Northern Isles. The value in the Clactol assemblage is, however, far-reaching. The radiocarbon dates and the collapse of the Broch has created a unique insight into the activities of an extended family that lived and worked in the area around 2000 years ago. We would argue that the artefact assemblage is a snapshot of one family, their artefacts probably made and used within the space of a few decades. Thus we should view all of the finds, bone, antler, pottery, iron, stone and wood, as an almost unique glimpse into an Iron Age domestic toolkit. Of particular note is the pottery assemblage, a small but important collection of vases, cooking, storage, eating and drinking vessels that show close ties with our Hebridean neighbours. Clactol pottery is now one of the few well-dated, arguably single-phased pottery assemblages from Middle Iron Age Scotland, the majority which fell from the upper floors or were left by the hearths as the roundhouse was abandoned. The iron assemblage is also of particular note, a rare cluster of tools associated with agriculture, food preparation and crafts. The stone lamps and wooden artefacts also provide a wonderful snapshot into Brock fixtures and fittings. Over a decade ago, Historic Ascent wished to explore their Brock to try and understand what life was like in the area 2000 years ago. They surely could not have believed that they would have literally found the remains of an abandoned domestic setting, the craft, food and agricultural tools abandoned as their maker's home collapsed.